Hi, you're welcome. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm going to do a quick overview of uh, the Fantastic Four, uh, the run of 26 stories uh, published in the 1970s, credited to Jerry Conway, John Buscema, and Rich Buckler taking over after John Buscema. They're by and large the three creators. Uh, it's a run of 26 stories which was published across Fantastic Four, Giant Size Superstars and Giant Size Fantastic Four. Uh, as I say, Jerry Conway had 23 credits in this run uh, as a writer. Pencilers John Buscema uh, and Rich Buckler. Uh, Buscema had nine credits and Rich Buckler had 13 credits in this run. Uh, the anchor pretty much across the board was uh, Joe Sennett. And the editor for all of these was Roy Thomas, who also had a hand in the writing. Various people um, substituting at various times over this run. There's 26 in the run. Uh, so let's take a run down through that run. Starting with Thundra at Dawn, uh, which runs in uh, Fantastic Four, 133. Uh, very dumb. It starts off with a much too long sequence of the FF feeling blue on New Year's Eve. Uh, this leads to a very strange appearance from Ton Tundra uh, trying to stop the clock in Times Square for some reason that really isn't made clear. She challenges the thing to a fight and then kidnaps his girlfriend and again it's not really made clear why any of this is happening. Finally Tundra beats the tar out of the thing and Reed is able to save the day by turning his friend back into the very normal Ben Grimm and it's all very odd and very very dumb and uh, 3 out of 10 was uh, all I gave that particular issue. A Dragon Stalks the Skies uh, from Fantastic Four 134. This is good fun. A bad guy is picking off the team members one by one. Plenty going on. It's a very enjoyable read. It zips along and by the end everyone except the Human Torch has been captured. Uh, it makes you want to read on. And I got 6 out of 10 I gave that particular one. Third issue in the run is The Eternity Machine from Fantastic Four 135. It wraps up the storyline from the previous issue with most of the team breaking free and setting up the chain of events that brings the bad guy to his doom. Uh, one of those actions stretches credibility to its limits, but it's an otherwise enjoyable read. Uh, there's a particularly clever juxtaposition of winners-losers in a couple of the closing panels that lingers after the comic is finished and is probably the best thing about it. For me, this got 5 out of 10. Rock Around the Cosmos from Fantastic Four 136. Completely off the wall. Uh, it's like FF meets Sliders. Uh, the TV show which I love uh, or something like that as the team wind up in a world shaped by the 1950s um, as well as the oddball stuff which starts off on page 9 I really loved the way the story shifted focus to tell us about one of the henchmen who worked for the bad guy in the last issue 10 out of 10 from me for this issue uh, Rumble on Planet 3 uh, Fantastic Four 137 a worthy and enjoyable finish to the story begun in the previous issue. Uh, it even ends the tale begun before that one. Uh, the Shaper of Worlds is a fascinating character. Story possibilities seem endless. 10 out of 10 from me for this one as well. Uh, Madness is the Miracle Man. Madness is the Miracle Man. Fantastic 4138. Uh, Miracle Man being the, the main guest character. Uh, there's nothing fantastic uh -huh, uh, about this issue other than the novelty of having no Mr. Fantastic or Invisible Woman on the team. Uh, the bad guy is so-so. His backstory is a bit too long and it kind of slows down the story. Other than that, it's an enjoyable middle-of-the-road comic. Six out of ten and a middle-of-the-road marking from me. Uh, Target Tomorrow. Fantastic Four 139. Uh, Miracle Man here again. An average battle issue as the team deal with the bad guy from last issue, uh, with several hints of upcoming plots. This bad guy is nothing special, and the short scene with the invisible woman is a tad stupid. Uh, putting the whole world in jeopardy seems like pointless overkill. 5 out of 10 from me for this issue. Annihilus. Revealed. Fantastic 4140, Annihilus. Um, this bad guy origin is pretty cool. 
very inventive. Uh, kind of makes uh, me like this particular bad guy, uh, even if he's an evil bastard. Uh, the soap opera stuff uh, this time out is less enjoyable. Uh, Reed and Sue are well matched. Both tend to have crazy, over-dramatic reactions to stuff. Uh, I wish to God they would just calm down. Six out of ten from me for this particular story. Uh, the end of the Fantastic Four dramatic title, uh, issue 141. Uh, the bad guy here is a bit tedious, but there's a nice sense of adventure here with the team on the run on an alien landscape. Other than the rants of Annihilus, the issue loses marks for a very over-the-top ending, with Mr. Fantastic forced to do something to save Frank Franklin and the world, and then being turned on by the others as a consequence. Uh, that's not a great finish. Uh, that's the last regular John Buscema issue. Uh, he had penciled 31 of the previous 34 issues, and uh, 5 out of 10 from me on that particular story. No Friend Beside Him. Uh, running in Fantastic Four 142. Um, basically, this is a solo thing story. Uh, meanwhile, most of the characters behave in annoying ways, creating false drama. But the thing battles are enjoyable, and the last pages leave me wanting to see what happens next. Uh, this is the first story with Rich Buckler uh, on pencils, and he will be credited on 21 of the next 29 issues. 5 out of 10 though for this particular issue of Fantastic Four. The Terrible Triumph of Doctor Doom running in issue 143 of the Fantastic Four. This is a good read. Uh, there's a clever bad guy with a seemingly unbeatable plan and there's a nice turn of events at the end. My only question why did Doctor Doom bother to capture the Fantastic Four at all, since his plan appears pretty much foolproof? Uh, of course, we'd have no story if he didn't, and it's easy to explain away his actions as the desires of ego. Uh, this is a very enjoyable chapter. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what Reed's plan is, and I gave that 9 out of 10. Uh, so yeah, really enjoyed issue 143. Attack! Uh, running in issue 144. It's a bit late in the story to introduce a new character, but this is still a satisfying ending to the Doctor Doom saga. Uh, the fight with the newly introduced Seeker seems like filler uh, to add a bit of action to the tale, and it's not really needed. Um, surely Darkoth could have done much of the same, particularly uh, the clever story idea uh, of him being invisible to the censors. Never mind, uh, the actual finale with Doom and Darkoth out in space was good. So 6 out of 10 for issue 144. The Mind of the Monster. Now, this ran in Giant Size Superstars 1. And Giant Size Superstars 1 is essentially Giant Size Fantastic Four 1. Because uh, there is no Giant Size Fantastic Four 1, but there is an issue 2 and 3 and 4. So essentially this is the first issue of Giant Size Fantastic Four. So the story ran in Superstars and it's a Fantastic Four story. It's a terrific thing Hulk battle where they have mind swapped and that is, if you haven't read it, that's exactly as cool as it sounds. Uh, there's also a great cameo from Tundra, who uh, as a character, I love that character. Uh, I loved this issue and it's just so much fun. And uh, Mr. Fantastic fuels uh, what I consider to be a very clever ending to that one. 10 out of 10 from me for that story. The Mind of the Monster, definitely worth reading. Nightmare in the Snow is next. This is Fantastic Four, issue 145. This is a solid adventure yarn. Uh, there's a novel location, which is an icy wilderness, and a novel team. Uh, it's Medusa and the Human Torch are the only team members in this issue. It's also one of those tales that starts in the middle of the story and then flashes back to the start. Uh, and I love uh, the Ross Andrew Joe Sennett artwork here. Uh, those panels of icy desolation are cool, literally cool. Um, six out of ten from me for that particular adventure yarn. Doomsday 200 Degrees Below, which is in issue 146 of the Fantastic Four. Uh, you gotta love a baddie with a goofy plan, 
and the plan here is freezing the world. Uh, there's an, this is an enjoyable conclusion. Uh, there's a good mixture of action and depth here. Human Torch and Medusa are not my favourite characters, by a long shot, but I must admit that I enjoyed seeing them as the leads in this particular tale. Johnny has always been my least favourite member of the Fantastic Four, although he was easily one of the best things about the movies, the original movies, the two movies that were done um, uh, over a decade ago or a decade ago. Seven out of ten for that particular particular issue 146 uh, doomsday 200 degrees below we're up to number 16 in this particular run of 26 and the next issue in the sequence is the submariner strikes which ran in fantastic four 147 this is a real what the heck is going on here story uh, and hopefully jerry conway uh, here writing his 16th story can pay off this story in later issues. Uh, I'm fascinated at this stage to find out what exactly Namor is up to and how it fits into his actions in his own series, uh, if it does fit into those. And I gave six out of ten to this particular issue. War on the 36th floor from Fantastic Four 148. Some villains attack. Uh, this is a pretty lazy way to generate a, by the numbers, battle heavy issue. Uh, the highlight is Tundra. Um, the most interesting pairing here is probably Mr. Fantastic versus Sandman. Their battle is probably the best because their powers are essentially so similar. Uh, apart from that, it's, it's all okay, but a bit predictable. And I gave this one five out of 10 when I read it. To love, honour and destroy. Uh, this story was published in Fantastic Four 149. Um, the revelation at the end of this is too far-fetched for me. I'm not buying it. And the Invisible Woman comes across very badly in this. Uh, this is hugely disappointing. Uh, and it's a hugely disappointing way to end an ongoing storyline, if you ask me. And I gave this 2 out of 10, which is as low as it gets, really, for me. Um, yeah, I rarely go that low, even. I don't really go 2 out of 10. So when I see that, it means I really didn't like this particular comic at all. Cataclysm, which ran in Giant Size Fantastic Four 2. Uh, this is a time travel romp. Uh, the end is a bit surreal, for my tastes, but these kind of stories are a lot of fun. Uh, the inclusion of Willie Lump Lim Willy Lumpkin adds to that fun, and I gave this 6 out of 10. Ultron 7, he'll rule the world, running in Fantastic Four 150. It's a brief battle, making clever use of Franklin Richards, followed by a lot of character stuff. And 9 out of 10 from me enjoyed this one. The Wedding of Crystal and Quicksilver, uh, which also ran, separate story, ran at the second story in Fantastic Four 150. I like how Jerry Conway, uh, now in his 21st FF story, uses the Wedding of Quicksilver and Crystal to generate lovely, reflective moments for Thor, Iron Man and the others especially for the Human Torch. And again, 9 out of 10 for this one. Uh, really enjoyed this. Wedding of Crystal and Quicksilver running in Fantastic Four 150. Down to the last few issues now in the run. Where Lurks Death Ride the Four Horsemen, which ran in Giant Size Fantastic Four 3. Uh, this is a pretty good story. Uh, epic scale, which I like. Everything falls into place a bit too neat at the end, but that is only a minor quibble here, and I give this 7 out of 10. Thundra and Lightning, running in Fantastic Four 151. Terrific action story with The Thing and The Human Torch, uh, nicely punctuated with scenes of Thundra, always a character of light, I keep saying that, I keep writing it down in my blog, it's true, and Medusa. Uh, a character I've always found to be bland. Uh, and we, as we get some backstory, uh, it is nicely done, perfect example of a good good middle-of-the-road superhero comic, and 7 out of 10, 7 out of 10 for this one. Uh, Thundra and Lightning. A World of Madness Made, running in Fantastic Four 152. This feels a bit rushed. Everything falls into place too easily. And this is the last of 23 Fantastic Four stories where Jerry Conway had a writing credit. Uh, I give this 5 out of 10. 
5 out of 10. After this, there's a couple of other issues. Um, Tony Isabella writing one, Lynn Wayne writing another, which finish out the run before uh, Roy Thomas takes over for the next run, um, essentially. So this next comic is Worlds in Collision, which ran in 153 of the Fantastic Four. There's too much battling and not enough story here. Also, elements of the conclusion are unintentionally hilarious. Uh, even a slug fest can be enjoyable, readable, when there's a likeable, amusing character in the middle of it, for example, the thing. Uh, but this issue, uh, 5 out of 10, was what I gave it. And bringing the run to uh, inhospicious ending, the 26th issue in this particular run uh, is called The Man in the Mystery Mask, uh, running in Fantastic Four 154. Now, it's hard to know which is sillier. The flashback, which is actually a reprint, this is a reprint of an older comic, or the present day stuff. Uh, it's all very silly, it's much too silly for me. So I ended the run much as I began the run, I think. Was it the same number? 3 out of 10 for this. And uh, yeah, funnily enough, it was 3 out of 10 at the start. But by and large, this run, which as I say was 26 comics, uh, 23 of them having Jerry Conway credited as a writer. Uh, this was a run that was above average and very enjoyable run on the Fantastic Four.